after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In our journey of looking at bad moral values or practices, we find that some of us unfortunately try to justify the haram. As we mentioned that some or a minute amount of people try to legalize haram. And we mentioned that man istahalla halalan faqad qafara whoever tries to make something which is haram halal or the opposite commits disbelief. Sufficient it would be for a Muslim to acknowledge their sin or their sins. Acknowledge they're doing something wrong so there's more opportunity for that person's tawbah to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when a person becomes arrogant and begins to justify their evil practices, then this becomes very dangerous. This becomes arrogance, becomes the way of shaitan, trying to justify oneself, not just in front of mankind, but trying to justify oneself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying to find may, ways and means that the haram that I'm doing inside my life is not actually haram. And then taking it even a step further, encouraging other people to do that haram, to legalize it and to find it as something which is acceptable. And thus we find that some of these sins that we mentioned are not just minor sins. Every type of sin a person should stay away from it. But we find unfortunately that some of us Muslims are involved inside Al-Kaba'ir in major sins and people can scream and shout at the state of the Muslim Ummah and non-Muslims role and whatever it may be but we have initially begun to destroy our own selves we begin to destroy our homes with our own hands by the sins that we commit and we don't seem to recognize that some of the sins that we commit are from amongst Al-Kaba'ir the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, Ijtanibu sab al Stay away from the seven destructive, deadly sins. So as a person needs to go and study such a hadith, what are the seven destructive, deadly sins? Obviously time doesn't permit us to go through them, but awwal and we find, Ashirku billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because many average Muslims, they get very upset that why are we always speaking about Tawheed? Why are we always speaking about oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why are we speaking out against people who commit shirk, who come to graves, who come to shrines, who worship awliya, who worship people, who worship the imams, who worship the saints, who go to the dead? Why? Because shirk is the fine line between paradise and the hellfire. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah mentions that Surah Al-Ma'idah إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ It's not we are saying it or the Prophet is saying it or the Imam is saying it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah has made it haram for that person to ever go to Jannah So a person shouldn't find it trivial Let every Muslim believe what they want to believe let any Muslim practice what they want to practice. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Allah sent amongst every nation, every people, He sent a messenger. What was the message? أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ Worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from anything which is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, he mentioned as-sihr. Black magic or magic. And the only way to enter into magic is via committing shirk billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once again, rampant amongst Muslims, carrying out of magic, getting magic done upon other individuals, harming other individuals, their own family members, their own loved ones, their own children, their own close relatives. Sihr is rampant, unfortunately. And it's not just a minor sin. The only way to enter into the realms of sihr is via shirk billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow, what concerns us, in the fourth or the, the fifth aspect of this hadith is aklul riba, the devouring, the eating of usury, of eating interest, is min al kabair. It's amongst the major sins that we find that unfortunately some individuals 
some Muslims, they try to, regal, as we began with, legalize riba. If a person, let's say, for argument's sake, may carry out a business transaction involving riba, not that we're justifying it, allowing it, but that's their own personal choice and they know it's a sin. As we mentioned, more chance of that individual being forgiven and coming out of that sin than a person who begins to push inside society and encourage people that this is a norm, a way of life. And this is a key element we need to understand. These individuals, they have carved deep into our mindset that هذا نظام الربوي that this banking system or taking of loans and interest is a normal way of life. They've carved it deep down into our blood. That average Muslim, whenever you speak to them, say this is, this is normality, this is a way of life. And there's various reasons why this begins to exist. Because unfortunately many of us are abid, many of us are still slaves. We've been ruled over for 150 years by these people. So to come out of slavery, as they say, isn't very swift or very easy. So whatever they practice and they preach to us and whatever they develop and they build, we think this is, this is the way of life. This is glory. This is the right thing to do for us to become successful individuals. And many times we mention this. In Sadr quran Allah mentions, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا In the beginning of Surah Al-Rum, the 30th chapter of the Qur'an. These people know everything about this dunya. You don't need to marvel about that. The Qur'an says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غافلون. As for the hereafter, they are heedless. Lost individuals, all that concerns with is this dunya. Striving and struggling for this dunya. They try to instill that within our system. The only way you can live a, a positive life is by you engaging inside these type of business transactions. Also, we find, unfortunately, that this concept, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then his messenger make something haram that hayatul bashariya yahtaju ilayhi? How can Allah make something haram that if you are saying that people need this inside their lives, then how can Allah make it haram? How is that plausible? Because the Quran mentions, Allah ya'lamu man khalaq wa huwa latiful khabir. Does not Allah know what He has created? And He is the most subtle, the most aware. And that's inside this muqaddama we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the past, the present, and the future. Laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la tabdila li khalqillah. There's no changing in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah lays down as, as, as haram remains haram. You can't move through society and from time and say, well, now it's something which is permissible because the need of the people, the desire of the people, that's what a siyasa is. That's what politics is. You can begin to visualize the, the shambles of man-made laws now because uh, p previously a few, few years ago, people begin to say, what's wrong with a political climate, a political system that's based upon their system of life? Now it's being shown, it's being visualized. Man's, because the political system of politics is based upon the desires, the needs of the people. It changes. What yesterday was, was haram, yesterday homosexuality was forbidden, today it's legalized. Why? On what basis? Because it's the needs and the wants and the likes of the people. The people want it, we have to legalize it. Not because God said, or the Bible condemns it, or the Torah condemns it, but it's the need of the people. The yearning desire of the people, the bills need to be passed, laws need to be passed for the people, for the benefit of the people. Or rather for the benefit of certain individuals. Because remember only 400 or so individuals sit in the House of Lords and represent the rest of this country. So whatever those people they decide is what we need will be passed as a bill, will be passed as constitution, will be passed as a law. That's not the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The law of Allah isn't given to human beings to choose and to select. The law of Allah is codified. It remains there for eternity. And that's what we need to understand that many of us, or some of us Muslims, fall into that trap. That the social climate around us, the environment around us, this is what we need to do. This is the only way to live a positive life. And second we find, Al-Marji' Al-Awwal fi tashri' huwa al-naqal wa laysa bil-aqal. The way that you understand everything about Islam is a naql is a nusus. It's not aqul, it's not, it's not your mind, it's not your intellect. That's a key thing we need to, we need to carve into our minds 
into our heart, into our minds that this is what Islam is. If Islam says pray like this, we pray like this. If Islam says a woman needs to dress like this, she dresses like this. If Islam says this is halal, we have to accept it. Islam says this is haram, we have to accept it. We need to carve this into our mindset. We don't need to answer everything. That's what many people think. They think every time they, they pose this question, why did the Prophet Islam get married to Aisha at this age? How is it plausible? We don't need to respond. Even the responses are there by ulama have given responses. We don't need to respond. We don't need to be in the back foot all the time and think, no, why does Islam allow polygyny? Why does Islam the marrying of more than one wife? Why does Islam say this about certain things? We're not obliged to respond. We don't have to respond. Because the whole concept of their life is based upon the rationale. Whatever the mind accepts, whatever the mind is able to comprehend, we will accept it inside our lives. That's not what Islam is. And likewise, as Muslims as well, our Islam should not be based upon rational proofs, on scientific, scientific evidences. Ulama mentioned the Quran is not a book of science. Islam is not a book of science. There's certain scientific facts that exist inside the Quran that are, that are plausible and are acceptable. But to approach the Quran, that the Quran is a book of science. Every time something is discovered, we need to find the answer inside the Quran, the evidence inside the Quran. The Quran is primarily a book of hudallinas. Is a book of guidance. A criterion between good and bad. That's what the Quran is. Quran is for guidance. Guide, guiding the individual to live a better life, a good life, a positive life, a life of devotion, commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why in today's hadith, dirhamun, dirhamun ribbon, ya'kulhun rajul. One, one, coin of, of riba, one small coin, a, a quarter, a dime, a nickel, a pound, a pound of, di, of this that an individual, an individual eats, and that person knows this money is some riba. We find such a stern warning, is more severe than committing adultery 36 times. One small coin of riba. That person knows this is this has come from riba. Is more is more severe than a person to carry out zina 36 times. Hadith Muslim of Imam Ahmed, likewise, the son of Imam Dar Qutni. Other harsh words that we find in prophetic traditions. A riba thalathatu was sab'una baban. Riba is some 70 odd branches or doors, different formats of riba that you find that exist. Aisaruha. The most easiest form of riba, the lightest form of riba is for a person to go and commit this evil action with their own mother. Linguistically repulsive words. How can a person approach their mother? How can even a person think about this? That's the easiest form of, 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 of riba. And the severest form of riba, in the Arba riba, irdur rajul muslim. And the most severe form of riba is to say something against the honesty, the integrity, speak ill of your Muslim brother. And here we want to pause and, and reflect the two contrasts. Because some of us may be so severe against riba. But the hadith mentions the hadith inside the authenticated like Sheikh Nasrin Albani in Al Jami' Al Sahir or Jami' Al Sahih. That we find that you mention that the, the person that you, you backbite, you speak ill of them, you say something about them. Is a, is a severe form of, of riba. It's a severe sin. But many of us, unfortunately, we find it very light on our tongues to speak about people, to condemn people, say words about another individual. person should be vigilant about their life. Everything that they do should be vigilant inside their life. What they say to another individual. And likewise, opposite extremists, hadith, how they interact inside their life. That's what Islam is. Al-ibadat wal-mu'amalat. Worship and mu'amalat with people. Some of us may be good worshippers, but our dealings with people are atrocious. Some of us, we work well with people, but our ibadah is atrocious. Life just becomes money. Life just becomes this dunya. There's no concept of ibadah. And likewise, the opposite. Life just becomes ibadah to, to hell with, excuse expression, how I work or how I speak to people, how I interact with people or towards other Muslims. No. That's not how a Muslim should be. Everything about a Muslim is trying their best. Is ibadah lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we find that some people may 
try to, you'll see this, try to question the, the authenticity of these ahadith. We don't want to delve into a, 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 a research about these ahadith. But let's just say for argument's sake, for a small second, there, there could be these wordings are, are very strong or harsh or these wordings are not plausible. Let us refer to the Qur'an. Let us see what, what, how, what the Qur'an speaks about a riba. Qur'an speaks about numerous sins. Numerous sins are mentioned inside the Qur'an. Shurb al-Khamr, drinking of alcohol, taking of intoxicants, a zina, committing adultery, fornication, stealing, lying, cheating, false oaths, robbery. All, all mentions are the Qur'an, all abominable sins, evil sins. Punishment at times is mentioned of them. And as if you want to see a key element of Al-Kabair, what are major sins inside the Qur'an? See the works of Imam Dhahabi, he collected some 80 or 90 major sins. وَقِيلَ أَنَّ إِشَارَ لِلْكَبَائِرِ A sign of an a evil or a major sin inside the Qur'an is تَعْذِيب عَذَاب إِقَاب Punishment, torture or what the person, the punishment on the face of this earth all symbols that this according to the Qur'an is classified or the sunnah is classified as a major sin. Is there any sin inside the Qur'an whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he has declared war? Does Allah say that about zina? Does Allah say that about shurb al-khamr? Does Allah say that about lying, about treachery, about murder, about slander? Does Allah, these are all grave sins. Does Allah mention that Allah has declared war upon that individual? There's only one place inside the Quran that we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, يَأْيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الرِّبَى Oh, you believe it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave whatever remains. Of riba, maybe previously you was unknown in Medinan period that we find that you find that people may be interacting riba. This, the Jews were taking riba, Jews were practicing riba. So now that you know, riba, leave whatever remains of riba in kuntum mu'minin. If you're really believing individuals, that's what iman is. Ya yul ikhwa, iman isn't qalat al arabu amanna. The Bedouin Arab said that we we believed. Just like today, Muslims say, I believe. Do I abandon riba? Do I abandon haram? Do I stay away from it? Or is it just in the tip of my tongue? Just false claims. Yes, I, I know it's haram. But what positive steps do I take? In kuntu mu'minin. To expel myself, to take myself away from this evil sin. فَإِن لَمْ تَفَعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you don't abstain from doing it, they know that Allah and then His Messenger have declared war upon that person. There's a war that we've entered is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has waged war on a people, on a nation, there's no success. In the tafsir that mentioned, Ibn Abbas mentions, خُذْ سَلَاحَكَ لِلْحَرْبِ Take your weapons and go and fight Allah. Only a madman would think that. Only a madman would think that I can fight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's why there's no barakah inside our lives, to put it simply. That's why there's no barakah in this Muslim ummah. Because it's not just a, 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 a micro scale, it's a macro scale. Because the world, as we began with, deals with riba. The world thinks that this is the normal norm of life. So we are in a major sin. The major sin is the downfall of this Muslim Ummah that we pay no attention towards it. That we begin to spiral down, down further and further. In other places of the Quran, Allah mentions, Ya illadina amanu, la ta'kulu riba ad'afa muda'afa, wa attaku Allah la'allakum tuflihun. Inside Surah Al-Imran we find Allah mentions, Oh you believe? Don't eat the doubling or multiplying of riba. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you may become successful individuals. Ulama, ulama have described what is the different form, two forms of riba that, that they are. But a common form of, of riba that we find exists in our society is the taking of wealth, the giving of wealth, loaning wealth to another individual. And then stipulating more wealth sh should be returned back to you. Adding an interest upon that. This is a common form that we find of riba. That we find inside our society. That we find because riba means excess, something extra which is placed upon the original loan that is given to the individual. As for various synonymous terms that people use, usury and interest and try to use different words. 
Words have no real meaning inside the Sharia. It's the, it's the concept. Switch the words around. If the concept exists of taking excessive amounts of wealth or placing extra wealth upon loaning of wealth, then this becomes something which is forbidden in the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The disgrace has also been prophesied by the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَةِ In a hadith in Sunnah Abi Dawood that we find. الْعِينَةَ نَوْءٌ مِنْ رِبَى إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَةِ وَأَخَذْتُمْ بِأَدْنَابِ الْبَقَرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرِ وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادِ سَلَّطَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلًّا لَا يَنْزِعُ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى دِينِكُمْ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم In this hadith he mentioned four things. إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَةِ You begin to engage inside usury interest. وَأَخَذْتُمْ بِأَذْنَابِ الْبَقَرِ You take the, the tails of, of the cows, the animals. Thirdly, وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرِ You become happy with cultivation, with land, plowing the earth. وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادِ You leave striving and struggling in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. سَلَّطَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلًّا Allah will send a disgrace upon you that he will never ever remove حَتَّى تَرْجِعُوا إِلَى دِينِكُمْ Until you don't return back to your deen. Hadith in the Sunnah of Abi Dawood Check by the late Shaykh Nasruddin Al-Albani Rahmatullah Alayh Listen to his recording and explanation or the state of this Muslim Ummah based upon this hadith and likewise what is written in explaining this hadith as well as the state of this Muslim Ummah showing clearly what we've fallen into that a key element beginning being the taking of usury, taking of interest has led us to being in a state of disgrace that we find and likewise we find is playing with words changing the words of context that we find or prior that we find another hadith that we find either ظهر الزنا riba. If zina becomes apparent inside society, riba becomes apparent inside society, فَقَدْ أَحَلُّوا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ أَوْ إِقَابَ اللَّهِ Then by, by their own selves they made halal. The punishment and torture of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has befallen them. That's why once again read أَشْرَاتُ sa'a. Read the 80 or 90 minor signs of the Day of Judgment. إِذَا ظَهَرَ الزِّنَا وَالْرِبَا Zina becomes rampant, becomes common. Some of the ahadith are quite accurate in detail if you study and read them. That people will fornicate on the streets. And the least that the person do is just turn it away and just, just find it repulsive, not, not approach or rebuke anybody. Which unfortunately we find inside that society. Because societies we began with a free society. Or free practice. Free to do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to practice. This isn't what Islam is. This is not what Islam stands for. We Muslims need to understand that their concept of life is different from our concept of life. You can't mix the two together and say, well, they have this inside their life, we need to have this inside our lives. What is forbidden is forbidden. person stays away from it to the best of the ability that we find. And then playing with words. They say that Riba is just a business transaction. It's just a dealing, it's just a transaction. Because they want to fool people. They want to justify to people what they're doing. But Allah mentions, Allah has made business transactions halal. You know, some people think that Islam is all doom and gloom, you can't enjoy wealth, you can't live wealth. That's not what the Quran says. When Allah subhanahu wa speaks at the end of Surah Al Qasas about Qarun, the wealth that was given to him. Read the tafsir of Imam Suyuti, Durul Manthur. Descriptive nature about the wealth that was given to him. Allah then mentions, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your fair share of this dunya. Ibn Abbas, رضي الله عنه, mentions, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَعْنَى الْآخِرَةِ الْأَعْمَالُ الصَّالِحَةِ أَوَّلًا Don't forget living in this dunya to do righteous actions. And then the second meaning is plausible. وَلَا تَنْسَ حَظُّكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا To take your fair share of living with this dunya. The good things. قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ Who is making haram? Who is making haram the good things that Allah has given to people on the face of this earth? وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ The good fruits, vegetation, 
the good produce on this earth that Allah brought forth. Who's making it haram? He's not allowed to make it haram. Enjoy. Kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu innahu la yuhibbul musrifin. Eat and drink and rejoice. But don't waste. And that's why many ulama have concluded to be a, a rich Muslim is far more superior if they have iman. It's been praised. You read, if you read works of ulama of tazkiyah, they praise a person with money. More is given to an individual. More praise is given to an individual because why? They know the rules and regulations that belong firstly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what will happen to these individuals who deal in a riba? Those who devour eat riba usury will stand on the day of judgment as if the shaitan has touched them. Various meanings can be derived from this. Firstly, on this dunya that we find, people in general who are involved inside riba live a frantic lost life. They are lost. They, they have a million. They want another million. Hadith that you find that the son of Adam has one valley of gold. He'd want another valley of gold. And nothing will quench that thirst except for the dust which is stuffed in his or her mouth. Al-Hakumutakathur The mutual rivalry of wealth and possessions derails you. Distracts you Hatta zurtumul maqabir Until you visit the graves What does it mean to go and visit the graves when you're living? La Al kinaya Anil maut When you're dead Some people the only time the quench of this dunya Is going to be take out of them is when they die Other than that the whole of their life Is chasing after the dunya Chasing after the wealth That's when hadith in Sahih Muslim it mentioned The person pays no attention لا يحتم بأن يكون حلالا أو حراما pays no attention to their wealth what is halal or haram all that they're worried about is chasing after this wealth and some ulama of tazkiyah mention the drunkenness of the dunya is far greater than the drunkenness of wine and alcohol and drugs if you get drunk with the dunya it seeps into you because we can see the love of the dunya Ad-damar wal kharab Dimar wal kharab Destruction Destruction Chasing after wealth Leads to destruction In another hadith Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali Gives a, a long explanation This hadith The most dangerous thing Far more severe Than a lone wolf To be left all on his own With two sheep What would a wolf do To two sheep He would devour them Eat them Take them alive. What is far more dangerous than that? Wealth. Greed for wealth. That is far more dangerous for an individual. When the greed for wealth begins to enter into their heart, into their mind, will take them away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second meaning on the day of judgment, the person will be raised in that state. In a state of frenzy, madness, that the shaitan has touched that individual. And a third meaning that ulama have extracted from this, this is evidence from the Qur'an of possession, of masu shaitan, of al jinn. That shaitan can enter into the body of a human being. In shaitan, jinn can touch an individual. Affliction, masu shaitan, ala badni shakhs, upon their body, upon their mind. Wa hatta wa qad nuqila. It's been documented Hatta al qatl Until even the jinn can take your life By the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah allows it Al-hikmah inda Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's been documented When people in extracting, extrapolating the jinn The jinn says that if you don't leave this individual to me Because I've fallen in deep love and devotion to this individual That this individual is going to be for no one and when the jinn leaves, takes the body as well. Well, كذلك العين, the evil eye, can enter and poison 
even a sheep, the intestines or the meat of the, the flesh, in turn it can be poisoned by the evil eye. Al-Ain Haq. The Prophet mentioned that the most thing that would destroy my Muslim Ummah will be this, the evil eye. The evil eye which exists inside this Muslim society, what other people possess, what people own. It leads people, as we began with the majors, it leads people towards sihr. It leads people towards shirk. It leads people towards jealousy. This is the wealth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He bestows upon whoever He wants to see how people will engage with it. What they will carry out with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a long hadith of Samra ibn Jundub, speaking about the night journey and what the Prophet he saw on the night journey. Read and study this hadith about the end of sins. Whereby in this depictive hadith that we find, he sees a blood, a river of blood. And a person comes from the middle of, of the river, comes towards the shore, comes towards the bank. And has his mouth open and the person throws a stone into his mouth and he goes back again and comes back again and forth again. The Prophet Islam asks, what is, what is the meaning of this hadith and other things that the hadith it speaks about which don't concern us a moment in time? The answer was given by Jibreel islam that individual that you saw, we can loosely translate it as blood suckers. That's what loan sharks are. That's what people are involved inside riba and and interest are blood suckers. All they're worried about is wealth. This person comes, the, a river of blood. Stone is thrown in their mouth. Again and again, return to that, the river of blood. A punishment, torture for that individual until the day of judgment that we find. And thus we find, as we mentioned, riba is nothing but destruction for the individual society that we find. Yamhaqullah riba wa yurbi sadaqat. Allah destroys riba. And, and flourishes, flowers, profit, sadaqat, wealth, makes it to flourish, benefits it. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we find that riba is forbidden by all of the, the previous faiths for, for the Jews. But as we know that forbidden for them to place usury or interest upon their fellow brethren as the Torah speaks. But as for the non-Jews and you're allowed to take interest from them. You're allowed to apply it upon them. That's why you study the whole concept of why they were, they were expelled. Find the whole basis was why the control of wealth. And that's why many times we need, we need to be crystal clear. Because once again, this has been filled inside our ears and our mind. We're not anti-Semitic. We never killed six million Jews. We never gassed them. We never tortured them. Archwish camp, you can go and visit today. You can go and see where they gassed and they tortured Jews. Nothing to do with us Muslims. We never harmed them. We never took away their lives. That they're very quick to accuse and blame Muslims. Study history. Who punished six million Jews? Who tortured them? Who burnt them alive? Who gassed them alive? It was a race that believed that they were supreme. A supreme race over all other people. And these people are placed inside society to take our wealth. To suck our wealth away from us. Just like today. The people who are taking our wealth away from us is the Muslims. So once again, history, as they say, repeats itself to create an image of Muslims, to demonize Muslims, to make Muslims look evil, to make Muslims look treacherous, to plant that seed. Then the next stage becomes then to do what? To take away their wealth and their power away from them. We find that on average, we find unfortunate that people encourage it inside their homes. People encourage their own children. People boast about it, the number of properties that they own, how they purchase them on a mortgage, from a remortgage. And this is, as we mentioned, a normal way of life. Even used to take the figures of just one home and do the calculation, whether it be a 15-year payment plan or a 30-year payment plan. Do the maths on what you borrow and what you return. You would say, only a mad person would do that. And even on a global level, the previous president of Nigeria said that we as a country, we borrowed 5 billion from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And we borrowed 5 billion. We return 
16 billion to them. And you know what they said? You still owe us 28 billion dollars. That's factual evidence. They borrowed 5 billion dollars, paid back 16 billion. And so at the end of it, the IMF tells them you are still indebted with 26 billion dollars. Go and study what is economic terrorism. Terrorism. Highlight that word. Economic terrorism. How they bring countries down to their knees. Because the whole system is designed that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. All these systems are designed to place people underneath this servitude and then to make countries and nations to go bankrupt. And thus we find Islam's overriding aim and objective is the happiness and well-being of the human being and individual and of society as a whole. As we mentioned, we're not against wealth. Read Mafatih al-Rizq of Dr. Fadl Ilahi. Read the, the keys of, of provision of wealth. Like with Imam Suyuti, he wrote a whole risala, usul al-Rizq, fi husul al-Rizq. The principles of, of gaining and acquiring wealth and benefiting by one's wealth. So we're not against wealth. Of multiplying one's wealth, of having wealth. It's about the usage of the wealth that we find. The wealth is the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to exploit other individuals. Wealth in Islam is neither despised nor to be taken as a god. That's why you find capitalism in a nutshell is wealth is God. That's what capitalism is. And the opposite is communism. Whereby the state controls people, controls the wealth of people. So everyone is only given five dollars to live their life by every day. That's what communism is. These are all extremities. And these 236 isms that exist in the world, there's only one is, is Islam. That guides people how to live their life in all of their affairs. In everything that they do. And thus we find that wealth, as you mentioned, is not haram. It's a need. It's about knowing what to do with one's wealth. In a prophetic tradition, we find how admirable is a pure, pure money for a righteous person. How admirable it is. If you read the context of the hadith, you find the Prophet mentioned Amr ibn As. He said that when you conquer this land, you overcome these people, great wealth will be given to you, the beauty will be given to you. Look at the companions. Amr ibn As, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I never became a Muslim for the dunya or for wealth or any luxuries. That's not why I became Muslim. That's not why I entered into Islam. That I want some, some beauty or some wealth to be given to me. I became Muslim sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the Prophet sometimes mentioned how, how admirable is pure money for a righteous person. Praising that he is sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus you find that the more if you study the ayah and speak about worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find something strange. Whenever Allah speaks about worship in general, it speaks about a rizq. Order your family members with prayer and persevere upon that. We don't ask you for any money. We don't ask you for any money. Allah's not asking anybody for any, any wealth in return. We will provide for you. What is the hidden meaning of this ayah? Order your family members and yourself with prayer. Ulama have mentioned that prayer is the golden gate to wealth of this dunya. As salah is the golden gate to Jannah. Inside the Akhra. As salah miftahul Jannah. Was salah ala dunya miftahul dunya. You know, everything inside the Quran when you study in great detail, Allah speaks about al anhar about rivers, about food, about drink, about clothing, about wealth, about property, about luxuries. Why? So you can equate yourself. So when you go to Jannah, when you enter into Jannah, you know what these things are. You see a replica of these things inside this dunya. Now you see the real essence of them. Allah equates to human beings 
And you mentioned, Allah ya'lamu man khalaq wa laqeekun khabir. Allah wants to linguistically entice us towards these things. Encourage us towards these things. Have them in his dunya in a good way. And you'll have them inside. And akhirah will be given to you believing individuals. And thus we find that the wealth that the person has used in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise in conclusion that the wealth that we find, the context of all these ayat, if you study them towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, is speaking about sadaqah. Speaking about charity. That's what it speaks about, the context of these ayat. And then eventually when Allah mentions, فَمَنْ جَاءُوا مَوْعِذَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ فَانْتَهَا فَلَوْ مَا سَلَفْ وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ عَادَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Whoever this mawridah, this admonition comes to that individual and they, they, they restrain, they take themselves away from these type of transactions, then that is a beneficial individual. His affair belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ عَادَ Whoever returns back to dealing in riba, dealing in interest, for those individuals, فَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And these are the companions of the hellfire. They will reside there. And in conclusion, we find that inside the context of these ayat, Allah mentioned one of the most powerful ayat of the Quran, which is classified as the final verse ever sent down to the Prophet ﷺ when he left this dunya. Nine days before he left this dunya, as Imam Suyuti inside his two volumes, inside an itqan fi ulum al-Quran mentions. This is classified Verse 281 of Surah Al-Baqarah is classified as the final verse of the Qur'an. Speaking prior to this about Sadaqah, about riba, after it speaking about ayah to the longest ayah inside the Qur'an, Allah mentions right in the middle of these ayahs, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّرْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ is the end of the Qur'an. The context is speaking about this dunya, ya yeah, ikhwah. About business transactions, about sadaqah, about life. But look at the, the theme of the Qur'an. Qur'an always returns back to an akhirah. Qur'an says, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Fear that day where you're going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear that day, all of us have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing we're going to be asked about the day of judgment, five things are going to be asked about that our feet won't move on that day. Two of those things are related to and what? Related to wealth. Two of the five things, where do you earn your money from? How do you earn your money, your wealth? And then how do you spend it? Two of the five questions Question answers on that day is, as some of us that we think that we can just blurt out the answers, we can just say the answers, we can just memorize the answers. That's not what Islam is. The answers are given by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's you find the Thabit Allah Ladina Aman with Qawli Thabiti fil Hayati Dunya fil Akhira. وَيُضِلُّ اللَّهُ الظَّالِمِينَ وَيَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah gives its back to people who believe. You try your best inside this dunya. Because we know in the prophetic tradition, everyone will have the dust, the dust of riba on their wealth. The transactions, withdrawing money from the bank, whatever it may be. Everyone has the, the dust of riba. Fear Allah as much as you can. Everyone will face that. But a person who's exerted themselves inside their life, to stay away from it. It's only a short life. In all honesty, it's only a short life. 40, 40, 50 years that we find. Even Hadith mentioned by the 16 or 17, 60 to 70 years. That's what our life is. So 60, 70 years of, 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 of renting a property. 60, 70 years of living in a, in a median home. 60, 70 years or 40, 50 years of living in this average, average place. There's no harm. If in return it's eternity. But as we began with, because people have penetrated into our mind that this is the global system, this is a system around us, how will we live, how will we operate, how can we have a, a peaceful life, this is for our children. Innama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna. What does it mean? Is I, your, your wealth and your children will be a fitna for you. How many parents are we engaged with? I do this for my son, I do this for my children. I took out a loan of riba. I took that loan out for my son. I took it so he could have a comfortable life. I'll take the blame. On that day, 
such audacity that you'll take the punishment on that day? The day that you find that person run away from their loved ones, from their own mother, their own father, their own children, and you have the audacity to say, I I'll take the blame on that day. I've done it for my children. It's a fitna that some of us have entered into, that we're worried, over worried. Do what you can inside your daily life. Allah will put barakah inside there. Unless you find a conclusion, you find that tradition mentioned that every child brings their own destiny. Brings wealth, brings property, brings blessings inside the home. These are not fables or myths, these are narrations that exist inside of, of barakah. There's, there's fathers who've been impoverished, and the children come and, and they become wealthy. Why? Because the father restrained, brought them up well, nurtured them well. Their wealth is given to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all a source of richness. All the richness, in, richness inside our hearts, of contentment, of peace, of love inside our hearts. We are happy with, with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. And at no moment that any element of our deen is lost by searching after the dunya. When you see that your salah begins to be compromised, your life of ibadah is being compromised by the wealth, then know that that wealth has become a fitna for you. Distraction taking you away, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayu alladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ala muhammad kama sallaita ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim inna ka hamidu makeel Allahumma barik ala muhammad wa ala ala muhammad kama barakta ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim inna ka hamidu makeel ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين ربنا اغفر لنا وإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إن غوف الرحيم ربنا تقبل منا إن كنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إن كنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين قوموا لصلاتكم يرحمكم الله